If you would uh, please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. You've probably forgotten by this time that we are in the Gospel of Mark, um, as we have spent really five weeks outside of it considering the topic of revival. And again, I'm, I'm hoping that... Um, Oh, I didn't mention, but uh, when we, we do return to the uh, discipleship class, uh, we are going to begin to take up the subject of the person and work of the Holy Spirit so that maybe we can keep these things in our minds a little bit longer and not lose what we uh, saw during the Reformation series so that we would continue to seek the Lord for His Spirit, that we might do what He would have us to do and that we might see what we would hope to see in the kingdom of heaven and that is people being converted. But we actually, before that series, we were in the Gospel of Mark, and we've worked our way through um, chapter 9. Actually, that's where we are. In the evenings, uh, we'll, we'll be returning to our series on God's attributes and why we should love Him uh, for those attributes. Uh, this evening, we're going to be looking at the fact that God is independent. He is self-existent. He doesn't need anything from anyone, but he, is, he has everything he needs within himself, and that is the reason why he will be able to fulfill everything that he has promised us, because he doesn't depend on anyone else for himself. That means that he can do what it is that he has promised he will do. But let's return now to Mark chapter 9. Our text this morning is verses 33 through 37. But I think what I'll do is just back up a couple of verses and read beginning in verse 30. So Mark 9, beginning in 30, but our text is 33 through 37. And from there they went out and began to go through Galilee. And he was unwilling for anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of God is to be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him. And when he has been killed... He will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he began to question them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. And sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he should be last of all and servant of all. And taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, as I mentioned, we are returning to our study in the Gospel of Mark this morning. Last time, as I've just read in these three verses, the first three verses, we saw Jesus beginning to head south uh, toward Jerusalem uh, because the time was drawing near for him to lay down his life. Now, again, we saw that he didn't want others to know really where he was so that he would not be delayed. Now, we also saw that while he was traveling, he continued to prepare his disciples for his coming death. So when it came, they would be ready to carry on the work. The fact, of course, that he was wanting to uh, prepare them was also a reason why he didn't want to be interrupted by others, which is why he wanted to move through that territory secretly. Now, their conversation, though, along the way, revealed another issue that Jesus Christ needed to deal with, something else the disciples needed to know so that they could serve the Lord better. And they need the lesson that we all need, and that is a lesson in humility. Our text this morning answers the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Now, you've likely asked yourself that question, I think, at some point in your life. And you may have answered it, not necessarily that it's going to be you, and as I have answered, it's not going to be me, but rather it's going to be those for whom the Lord has prepared it. The disciples were asking this question, and they were debating it among themselves. And when they had come together in the house, Jesus asked them what it was they were talking about along the way. And of course, nobody answered that question. I mean, you know how it is when somebody asks you what it was you were doing, what it was you were saying, 
but you were doing something or saying something that you shouldn't have been, and so you choose not to answer the question, or at least you um, don't answer it right away, as you try to think of a way to answer it that doesn't incriminate you, but shows that you are actually doing the right thing. Well, they were talking about something they shouldn't have been talking about, and that is which among them would be the greatest, or which one actually was the greatest, right now in the kingdom of heaven? Which one of them? Which one of them would have the place of greatest honor? Now you know that this is a pride issue, and pride is sin, and that's why they didn't want to answer. But Jesus already knew what it was they were discussing, and he knew that they needed to be broken of that particular sin before they were going to be useful. And so he decided he would answer that question. Who is the greatest? Jesus said, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And since there's really no better way to communicate a principle than to provide an object lesson, I believe Jesus then gave them one. Now, it's not clear in our text that that's what he's doing in Mark, but when we look at Luke and we look at uh, Matthew, we see that that is, in fact, exactly what he was doing. We read in Luke 9, verses 46 through 48, an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. The one who is the least, the one who is like this child, is the one who is great in God's kingdom. And then in Matthew's gospel, and he called it, excuse me, this is in Matthew 18, verses 2 through 5. And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. I hope you can see the context is the same. Uh, Mark is speaking about the same uh, situation that these other two address. And in these circumstances, the Lord is actually putting the child in front of them as an example of humility. Jesus says in one sense, you actually have to become like children before you can even enter the kingdom of heaven. But having entered, you must humble yourself like a child if you are to be among the greatest. Now this morning, let's consider that the way to greatness in God's kingdom is by way of service. You must become the servant of all. By the way, that also includes humility. So first of all, we'll look at the example that Jesus gives and what it means, why he picked a child to point this out. And secondly, we'll consider how we should apply this to our lives. How can we become like children? So first of all, let's consider the example that Jesus gives of being the least. He gives the example of a child. And the first question we should ask is why Jesus chose a child as an example. What exactly does he have in mind here? Now, there are those who consider this to mean that children are innocent, Somehow, they don't struggle with sins that others struggle, at least until they reach a certain age, and that would be the age of accountability. That somehow they don't have a, a sin nature, or if they do have one, it doesn't turn on to the point where they actually become guilty until they're older, again, until they reach that certain age. And they think, what better example could Jesus possibly have drawn upon than that of the innocency of children? Now, whoever thinks that way must have never had children of their own because they would know that isn't the case, and they certainly must have forgotten that they were once a child and what their heart was like, or at least haven't reflected upon their nature because children are not innocent. The Bible says that in Adam all die, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That there is none who does good, there is not even one. And that's not talking just about adults, that's talking about everyone. So the question is, why would Jesus point to children? Well, another possibility is that um, maybe this child was very young. 
and hadn't grown, uh, as it were, enough to exhibit that, those prideful and sinful characteristics of sinful men. And it was just the best example that Jesus had available to him to point to their humility. Now, when children are very young, I mean, truly, they do have a good degree of selfishness and self-centeredness. I mean, really, a child's world revolves around himself. But they haven't quite fully learned by, at this point, I think, the concept, although they know it, they know it somewhat. And I'm talking about very young children. By the way, I should mention that uh, the word used here when it says that Jesus set a child before him is a word that has a range of, of ages. It doesn't define any exact age, but we do know it's not a young man. We do know the child could be very, very young, can be even as young as an infant. So I think Jesus is referring to a child that is pretty young here. And when they're young, they haven't yet learned perhaps the concept of the pecking order. And there, there is an age at which children, when you put them together, they just seem to get along. You know, it just doesn't seem to matter to them who's better than the other. They just have fun together and they accept one another. And they seem to have a certain kind of humility about them when they interact with one another, and especially with adults. You know, a fear of adults. There is that age in which children do respect adults, and of course they struggle with it as they get older, as their mind develops and so forth, and sadly as their sin develops as well. But there is a certain humility in a child compared to what that child will become. And perhaps Jesus is pointing to those particular characteristics within the child. Now, there's probably truth to that, and I think that's the way it's normally looked at, but there is one other point that we don't want to miss in these texts, and that is the possibility that this child was actually converted, that Jesus was not speaking about an unconverted child and pointing, you know, this child that had nothing but a sinful nature as an example of what they are to be if they're to enter the kingdom or if they are to be the greatest. Now, Luke doesn't mention it in his text, but Matthew and Mark do. Let me read Matthew, first of all. I've already read a portion of it in Matthew 18, but here's the succeeding verses, verses 4 through 6. Jesus says, whoever then humbles himself as this child, okay, notice this child, it's, it's pointing to a particular child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now again, some take this to mean that children in their, their innocency would look to Jesus. The parent says, look, this is the Messiah, and the child says, oh, really? Oh, hi, Messiah. You know, they just believe whatever you tell them. But I don't think that's the kind of belief Jesus had in mind here. He says, this little one believes in me. And he's talking about children like this one that he's pointing to as an example. If you look in Mark, in our text, if you go down a little bit further to verse 42, you have a repetition of exactly the same thing we read in Matthew. Again, recording the same conversation. We don't have a switching of circumstances or of locality here. Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, who believe, it would be better for him if, with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. Now, I know that this passage is often uh, applied to those who come to Jesus with a childlike faith, saying that if, if there's a sort of a novice believer, a new believer, it would be better rather than to stumble this, this new believer to wrap a chain around your neck with a heavy stone and be cast into the ocean. It's a serious sin to stumble uh, a new believer. But I don't think Jesus is referring to that, although it may have application to that. I think he's referring to children, little ones, who actually believe in him. Now, they must be, I think, fairly rare. They seem to be rare today, but we did see one during the Great Awakening. Remember Phoebe Bartlett? Uh, how she was, I, th I think she was, what, only four years old, amazingly young. I forget, it was four or seven now. Very, very young and exhibiting such a love for the Lord that was beyond what most of us have experienced in our lives. Tremendous desire for the salvation of others. Uh, grief over 
over doing something that might have offended her Lord. I mean, she was only four years old in the closet praying for the salvation of her, of her friends and of her, her family members, of her brothers and sisters. Amazing. Yes, there are children who are actually converted. And I do think that that's what Jesus has in mind here. What we may have here is a converted child who would really have a combination of, of this childlike humility because it's still, there is still a certain humility about children, but also has the Spirit of God working in his heart, who is, in fact, humble, okay? I think you understand, as well as I do, at, at your particular point of, of, let's say, spiritual maturity in God's kingdom, that when you're first converted, you're just happy to know the Lord. You're just happy to be in the kingdom of heaven. You're just overjoyed, and that's all you're concerned about. But after you've been in the kingdom for a little while, uh, things do change, sadly. Uh, we begin to experience things that we haven't experienced before with regard to our sins. I think it's because the Lord is gracious up front and he seems to give a great grace to new believers to kind of get them established. And he doesn't just throw them, as it were, into the trials and the temptations they're going to have to face in order to grow up right away. One of the temptations that you face as you're growing in the Lord is this temptation to exalt yourself, to want to make your mark in the world. The apostles at this point had been perhaps, uh, well, if they, if they weren't believers when the Lord called them into service, it's possible that they already were. But um, they were perhaps relatively young in the Lord, but they're reaching a point now where they're beginning to bicker among themselves who is going to be the greatest how are they going to be rewarded by the Lord? Is my reward going to be bigger than your reward? Am, am I going to be remembered more than you and more greatly honored by the Lord? I mean, they were caught up in this whole thing instead of doing what it is they should have been doing, and that is just being humble servants. If they kept up what they're doing, none of them would be the greatest. So again, what the Lord is telling us here is that we must humble ourselves to become servants. We must humble ourselves as a child to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but not some unbelieving child, but a believing child who ha still has that, that simplicity and that humility of a younger years combined with the Spirit of God working in their heart to promote that kind of grace. Perhaps the best example Jesus could have found outside of himself, of course, because he is the perfect example. A child, by comparison, was nowhere near where Jesus was. So that is the principle. That is what we need to become if we are to be great in his kingdom. Now let's apply this. How can we put this on? If you and I are going to attain a measure of greatness before the Lord, then first of all, you need to understand that what Jesus is presenting here is the opposite of the way you were taught by the world. You don't have to look very far to see what the world is doing. They want to be great. And the way they go about becoming great is always at the expense of other people. Well, always, most often. There are some we might call the virtuous unbeliever who can only do that by God's restraining grace, not because there's any goodness in them necessarily. Still by God's common grace, but again, not very often the case. Most people climb over the backs of others in order to exalt themselves. If getting ahead means that you have to lie about someone else, then you lie. Or if you take credit for somebody else's work, you take the credit. Or you take advantage of others in some way so that you can stand out. That's what you do in the world to gain recognition, to gain praise for yourself. They basically do whatever it takes. Their whole purpose in life is basically to draw attention to themselves. Again, the very thing that Paul tells us as he moves into that example about Christ, don't do anything out of selfishness or empty conceit. That's exactly what the world's all about, selfishness. Now, Jesus reproved the Pharisees for doing this very thing. Remember what the Pharisees would do before they would uh, give? They'd blow the trumpet so that everybody would see, I'm about to give, and they could see him give, and they could praise him for being such a holy person. Whenever they would pray, they would stand on the street corner so everybody could see them pray, or they would stand up in the synagogues and pray. Again, they wanted others to recognize them. 
or sometimes they would just belittle others so that they would feel better themselves, such as when the Pharisee and the, the tax collector went into the temple to pray, and the Pharisee is looking down his nose at the tax collector and thinking about all the things that are wrong with him so that he can feel better about himself while the tax collector was doing what he really needed to do, and that is beating his breasts and crying out for mercy, not even willing to look up to heaven. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. There are those who are concerned about nothing else than just leaving their mark on this world. They want to be remembered after they're dead. They want greatness. Everybody wants to be great in a certain sense. They want credit for what they do. They want honor. They want glory. Well, I hope you see the problem with that because to whom belongs all the glory in the world except to the Lord. Jesus says you are not to be like this. If you are in his kingdom, you are to seek to be the very least if you are to be the greatest. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Why he is the greatest in the kingdom of God is because he was the one who stooped the lowest. Remember what we read in Philippians chapter 2. Being in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, took the form of bondservant, even more than that, he became accursed, nailed to the cross, that he might bring life to others. And for that reason, the Lord exalted him. Jesus said to his disciples on another occasion in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If you want to be great, you have to humble yourself to become the least. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about what it was like, again, to be a child. I realize the older you get, the harder it is to remember what things were like when you were a child. And I know we don't remember our childhood exactly the way it actually was. Sometimes I think we think, you know, it's, it's well, better than it was. That's the way we tend to be. But I do know from experience and just from, again, having our children when they're very, very young, they sometimes do things for their parents simply for the pleasure of doing them and not for praise even though it's not that they mind praise, they certainly like it, but that, that wasn't what they had in mind. I, I remember a long time ago when I must have been about, well, probably less than five years old, visiting my grandparents in Florida. It was Easter. Grandparents, I think it was my grandparents, could have been my parents, very graciously put together an Easter basket. That was our tradition in those days. Full of candy. And I remember my, grand, my grandfather didn't have any candy, and I remember I wanted to give him something, and he wouldn't take it. And it just grieved my heart because I wanted him to have it. I just remember that that's all I wanted. I didn't want him to praise me for it. I just wanted him to have it because I wanted him to do something good for him, something nice. And so he finally took it from me and then he snuck it back into the basket when I wasn't looking. I was told years later and, oh, you know, <laughs> was shattered. But again, some children, you know, at a certain age, they just want to do this thing because it's, it's they just want to please somebody else. Well, that's exactly what the Lord tells us that we ought to do, to give, to please others, to serve others, to help others, and not to give so that people can praise us and give us credit for it. There's a hymn that we often sing in our hymnal, Come Thou Almighty King. And when I open the page to that particular hymn, I'm always struck by the name of the author because the author's name is anonymous. Somebody in the 18th century wrote this hymn, went through all the trouble to write it, and yet didn't take any credit for it, apparently. Now, again, I'm not sure exactly why it's anonymous. It may be that he wrote this hymn in an environment where it would have been dangerous to be identified with it, so he didn't put his name to it. That's certainly possible. Or it may just be that he wrote a hymn that he wanted to glorify God and wanted no glory for himself, so he just simply put it out there without drawing attention to himself. Now, sometimes authors can avoid 
putting their names to their works, especially if they want those works to be accepted. But there have been things written in history where people did not put their names to it simply because they did not want to be recognized or be, receive the glory for it. They wanted glory to go to God. So again, the question is, who is going to be the greatest in God's kingdom? Who is going to sit on his right hand and on his left? Jesus said that these were not his to give, but they were for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And so we ask this question, is it going to be Augustine? And he was a great theologian, great leader in the church, although he certainly had his problems. He wrote in the fourth century, fifth century, and because of that, he didn't fully understand things the way we do. Luther, who began the Reformation and fought very valiantly at the, at the risk of his life throughout practically his whole life. Will it be John Calvin who organized all that theology and organized the church and church order in Geneva? Is it going to be Whitfield, one of the greatest evangelists who ever lived next to the Apostle Paul? Is it going to be my particular favorite, Jonathan Edwards, <laughs> who had such not only insight into the word, but again was a major leader in the Great Awakening? Or is it going to be Spurgeon, that great communicator of the gospel who preached to thousands every Lord's Day and left us so many books? Well, you know, it's possible that when we arrive in heaven and we see those two places occupied, that we may not even recognize the people who are there because they did their work more secretly, perhaps these that I've just spoken about, these six, because they've already received such honor from the Father. Perhaps they are not the ones. Perhaps those who were going to sit at his right and at his left did their work so well concealed that no one actually knew that they did what they did to honor the Lord as greatly as they did. They took what Jesus said to heart so completely that they stayed behind the scenes so that no one could see them. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Sometimes those rewards come in life rather than in heaven, especially if we happen to be honored for them here. But really the question comes down to this. What about you? What are the honors that the Lord is going to give to you? How can you increase those honors? You know, sometimes it's hard not to want to blow your own horn, especially when it seems like everybody around you in the particular conversation is doing that. You know what I mean? Uh, you want to just, you know, not talk about those kinds of things, but sometimes you hear the people just saying, well, I did this and I did that, and it makes you want to tell them what you've done so that you can either one-up them or at least, you know, come up to where they are. Well, the Lord says you've got to resist the temptation to do that because every time you blow your horn, you lose rewards. And the honor that the Lord intended to give you or the otherwise would have given you is now lost. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you have to resist the spotlight. Resist putting yourself ahead of other people. Don't take the credit for what you do or try to gain recognition for yourself. Instead, draw attention to what other people do. Again, didn't Paul tell us that we need to try to outdo one another in showing honor to one another rather than drawing the attention to ourselves? The one we are especially supposed to glorify is the Father. Now, what is the problem then with stepping into the limelight? What is the problem with, with having all these people looking at you and, and why you shouldn't be seeking for that glory? is because that's all you're going to get. That's it. There is a glory that comes after this that is much greater, and you lose that when you seek for glory in this world. So as much as possible, serve in secret. By the way, this is not an argument not to serve the Lord. I mean, if you don't serve the Lord, then nobody's going to see it and so forth. But this is an argument to serve the Lord secretly as much as possible so that only he sees it and then he will reward you. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do things in public either. I mean, does that mean if you gather together for public prayer, that because other people see you praying, that that's all the reward you're gonna get for it? Well, not really because the rest of us are praying too, but 
that's not all you should be doing. You should also be praying in secret. Give yourself to secret prayer where others can't see you and where the Lord will reward you. Uh, we are to give, but we are to do our giving in secret. Uh, again, don't blow the trumpet like the Pharisees do so everyone can see your act of charity. When you minister to other people as much as possible, try to do it in a way that the recipients of that kindness do not know to whom they are indebted, if that's possible. Sometimes it isn't possible. I was thinking about one particular person who it actually came out after he was dead, and the person who, uh, who wrote about it said, well, since he's dead, I guess this really, I can really tell you now what it was, and I think he actually intended it to be secret all the way through his life, so I won't tell you who it was, but whenever he wanted to, to give to someone, and he himself had a large family and had a difficult time making ends meet, but he always reserved some money to give to the poor. And whenever he gave to the poor, he always gave it through someone else so that the person who received the gift would not know who gave it to him. Now, the person who, who was the middleman knew who it was, but I think this person was, of course, depending on their discretion. If it's possible not to have a middleman, you can do that. I think in those days, you, you had to have a middleman. Otherwise, you'd have to skulk around and try to do it secretly, and you might get caught. Today, you can just stick it in the mail, and you know, I don't think they had mail in those days. But again, do these things in secret. That's the, uh, as it were, the secret of how to be rewarded by the Lord for them, because as many people who know about what you've done and who praise you for it or give you some kind of recognition, to that degree, you're losing something of your reward. It reminds me of uh, in, in the days that I was in this full gospel church, Pentecostal charismatic church, I used to have these guys coming through all the time asking for donations. And the Lord told me, you know, there's 10 people here that are going to give $1,000 to my ministry. Don't grieve the spirit. Raise your hand, you know. And somebody would raise their hand, and you'd be this big round of applause. And I remember even in those days when I was still relatively young, reading what the Lord said, <laughs> If people praise you in this life for it, you get no reward for it. I said, well, that person just lost the reward for that gift, and that person lost the reward for that gift. Why is this person asking people to give publicly? Well, the reason why he was is because he was shaming them into giving, and he found that an effective way to do it. By the way, 10 people did not give $1,000, so that message did not come from the Holy Spirit. The man was a false prophet. After he couldn't get the, the 10, then he says, well, the Lord just told me there's going to be 10 more that are going to give 100, and that'll make up the difference. Uh, okay, so the Lord changed his mind. Couldn't get 10, okay. No. Anyway, you don't do it in public. Now, again, you can't always avoid the eyes of others, but when they see you doing what you're doing for the Lord, make sure that you do what you do in such a way that when men see your good works... They glorify your Father who is in heaven. So after you've settled the question of your eternal destiny by humbling yourself to become a child, realizing that you cannot stand before God on your own, you have to humble yourself and trust Jesus Christ to save you and turn from your sins, then you need to humble yourself like a child and serve the Lord in a way that would honor him. Serve purely for the pleasure of serving and pleasing other people with the humility of a child and try to do it as secretly as you can and the Lord will reward you, he says, openly. Well, may the Lord help us all to do this. May he help us to humble ourselves that we might better serve him and that we might have a greater reward in heaven. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us do that.